Hi, I'm Rich Laveau. At Bloomfield College, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by MagnaCare, New Jersey Resources, Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868, Wells Fargo, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Watchung Hills Regional High School for this afternoon's softball matchup between the 100 and Central Red Devils and your Watchung Hills Warriors. Pitching today for the Watchung Hills Warriors, number 22, Alyssa Murray. My relationship with the softball team, what can I say? I mean, they're, I mean, they're like, they're like my sisters. They're family to me. They got my back. I, I got their back. Win or lose, I'm proud of them no matter what. And that's why I like the team, and that's why they like me. There's the man. That was the voice, and there's the man and his dad. That's uh, Skylar Weisberg, the voice of Watchung Hills, and uh, Mark Weisberg, Skylar's dad, who produced that guy. How good is that guy? Very good. Totally impressed. How, first of all, I have to know, how did you start your career as a broadcaster? I actually got started back in 2004 when I had surgery on both of my legs, I think last year, 2003. I started to watch the Los Angeles Lakers and Detroit Pistons game three of the NBA Finals, and I heard the PA announcer, John Mason, who still does Detroit Pistons games to this day, and I've been hearing about how he gets created with the names like Chauncey Billups, Ben Wallace, Richard Hamilton, Rashid Wallace, for example. And then I got hooked during that time. And then ever since then, John Mason inspired me to become the PA, the PA announcer and the voice that I am today at Watch on Hills. When did you know that he had this gift? Because he had some other challenges like... Well, the beauty about it is he never let his challenges. Tell folks no, because not everybody. I figured everybody knows who you are, because I saw you on the <laughs> internet. You're an internet sensation. Uh, some personal friends we have up in your area, the Lupos, you know who they are? Yeah, I know about them. Yeah, I know about them, too. And they said, <laughs> you got to check this guy out. Now, for those who don't know. OK, Skyler was diagnosed early with cerebral palsy. And throughout middle school into high school, uh, He's always been a sports fanatic. And he's the person that goes into the office and turns off the sound and watches a game and broadcasts the game without the sound uh, in the office. So I used to coach Little League. And he would announce our game in a dugout. And finally, we said, you know what? Let's give him a microphone and sit in the dugout. And we got a karaoke machine and gave him the mic, and he went off. <laughs> he just went off. And uh, he took it from there. He went into middle school, started announcing there, went to high school, somebody found him. And from there, it's just escalated to your show. Yeah, well, it's going to get bigger <laughs> than that. But you know what's so interesting about you, Skylar, is that as I've talked to folks about you, it's not just that you're a broadcaster. It's not just that you announce the games. You're a motivator. I've seen you on video talk to these young women before a softball game and get them motivated for the game. Your special connection to them and with them is extraordinary. How did that develop? Basically, what I do during the softball game, my coach, Jeff Dealman, one of the coaches there, usually does this home and follow call after they do the warms on the outfield. 
And what he does is he gets the team together and they do a group, they do a high five, like, like I high five the team as they come out. And then they gather near our dugout on the first, on the third base side, because that's our home dugout. And then I normally do a pregame speech, like a, like a pregame pep talk to get all the hype going to them and make, and then get them motivated to win the game. Let's listen to some of the girls on the softball team talk about you announcing. Go, let's go to the clip. He came out for the first game, took the mic, and we knew he had to be with us for the rest of the time. Once he came, it just got rolling. And I mean, for me personally, it, I absolutely love stepping up to the plate with hearing him announce my name. Leading off the bottom half of the third, the shortstop number 24, Megan Kovac. All right, so when you get that microphone in your hand, What's it feel like? I feel a second adrenaline rush. It, I'm like, I'm in my zone when it comes to the microphone and when I do the games, it's like, okay, I got my game face on, I got the lineups, let's just kick butt on the mic and do what I do. Well, he's got the microphone in his hand. Where are you? Probably right next to him. Where are you beyond physically? We're emotionally uh, and mentally. Proud. Proud. Because, like I said, he's never let anything slow him down. And the fact that it's very, very exciting for me to watch him do it. And it's more exciting to get the res uh, you know, results or people coming up to me yeah. afterwards to tell me how wonderful he is. The teams, he does for different teams. He does basketball, he does baseball, all teams in, in high school. Uh, for the coaches to come up to me to tell me how proud they are, for the teams to wrap their arms around him as make him one of them, uh, their own, and to keep him involved. It's a I wonderful feeling. I don't think people have any idea how much preparation is involved. I mean, you have to prep for these games. <laughs> Describe it. It's a lot of preparation, hard work, like you said. Well, for example, for softball, when I get to the field, I will have to get the lineups from our coach, Mike Del Sandro, from watching those softball. You have to say the names correctly. <laughs> yeah. This job is so hard that way. I screw it up all the time. You never make mistakes. How do you do that? Well, Deal, Dealman and I they basically go over the visiting team's pronunciation oh, you practice. of the names. Yeah, That's because, my problem. I don't practice. Well, maybe you need to work on it a little more. <laughs> hey, hey, every, why is it that everybody in the control room is laughing and everyone in the studio? All right, I'll start practicing. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, well, I apologize. Like I interrupted. I, like I said, Dealman and I go over the visiting in team's pronunciation. Like, on the clip, we were playing 100 and Central Red Devils back I believe it was 2014. Tough names. Yeah, there was like Malgeri and Samanchik. We, we went over all those names, and then I was like, okay, deal, I got this. You don't need to tell me anymore, I got it. <laughs> and then during the game, and we, I, went, I read all the names, everybody liked it, yeah. the crowd liked it, and then we won the game, it was 16 to one, and then I got so happy because I love when one of my teams win. Like, like I said, I usually do multiple sports like softball, yeah. men's and girls basketball, field hockey. You're and part I, of the team, though. You're not an objective broadcaster. Oh, no. I'm not. <laughs> not at all. You're all in. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, yeah. I'm all in. And um, I also do girls soccer, which I actually started this past year. Like you don't have enough to do already. <laughs> yeah, I just got to keep myself busy because... Hey, a lot of the team teams want me. Like, I get noticed every time when I came and watch on Do you actually go to school? Do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do? Like, you're just a professional broadcaster now? Well, I have to get my education first. What's your career going to look like five years from now, ten years from now? I, I mean, I know you're going to take over this job and any other job you want, but what's the plan? Well, I don't know about this show. That's trademarked to you, but... <laughs> <laughs> this isn't big enough for you. <laughs> it's not big enough for you, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that part out. Okay. okay. What do you want for yourself? Tell me. Well, I want to do more 
PA announcing for professional sports teams. Right. I like want to move on to the Somerset Patriots at Bridgewater or maybe right. the Brooklyn Nets during basketball season. And next year when I go on to college, maybe I can start by working by the radio station like TCNJ or Union County, for example. I just want to get more involved with the broadcasting and just like I did on the video, inspire more people to do what they do. Final words for parents out there. Proud as can be. Parents who tell their, themselves, hey, you know, my kid's got some challenge. Can't expect much, you say. BS. The kid, the kid motivates himself, motivate your children. They can do anything. He's proven it. He's also motivated a lot of people here in the studio today and a lot of people watching on public broadcasting and Fios. And I want to thank you, Mark, but I especially want to tell you, Skylar, that we are so proud of you. You are a credit to the broadcasting field, and you are going to raise the bar for all of us uh, in this business. And I look forward, we all look forward to working for you one day. How's that? Well, we're going to have to wait Just, a couple years. You can't years. even say thank you? That's it? You can't say We're going to have okay, to go wait ahead. for a couple years, so <laughs> thanks for having us. It's been a real honor, and um, we're looking forward to do more shows with you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much. That's why I love this show, because the kids like this. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Jaya Srinivasan, who is uh, Chief Pediatric Rheumatology at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. We've had these conversations off the air. We're actually... Um, doing a seminar talking about uh, actually medical communication mm -hmm. for physicians and how challenging it is sometimes yes. to talk about uh, clinical issues to a non-clinical audience. And one of the first questions I asked you in a seminar was, what's the difference between juvenile arthritis and arthritis in an adult? Help folks understand that. Well, when patients or parents come to me and they bring their child for joint pains or when anyone hears about it, they say, what, kids can get arthritis? Cause when Which they, I didn't know, by the way. When they think of arthritis, they think of their grandparents having arthritis and people walking around with canes and wheelchairs and people in their 80s, not two-year-olds. So the main difference is that the arthritis that you see in your grandparents is not the same that you see in children. But what children, is it in children? So in children, they, arthritis is basically when you get swelling and difficulty moving your joints and it's basically inflammation in the specific joints that are affected. How would you diagnose it? It's, there's no blood test, there's no um, imaging or anything that is specific for arthritis. You have to take a very, very thorough history and do a full physical exam where you're checking every single joint. When someone comes to my office, I check every single joint, even if they're only complaining about their knees. I check their fingers, their neck, their back, because they may not necessarily notice. And you look to see how well these joints move. You look to see if there's fluid within the joint. And it takes several years of training and practice to really be able to examine and figure if someone has arthritis. But, but Doctor, you know what's so fascinating about this? First, there's a couple things. One, there are only 300 doctors, physicians, who do what you do in the country. And you just said before we got on the air, there are some states that don't even have any. Right. Why is that? Well, it's the conditions that pediatric rheumatologists deal with are very rare conditions. And even though that they're rare, the fact that we only have approximately 300 pediatric rheumatologists, the demand is definitely there. And it, since these are very rare conditions, it wasn't really well known previously and there weren't as many patients who had it. So people really weren't going into the Where do they go, though? So say someone, uh, here's what's confusing to me. A child isn't going to be able very often to communicate or say, well, you know, I think I need to see a pediatric rheumatologist. <laughs> so it's the parent who's now the advocate for the child. What should the parent be looking for? Well, the parent would 
take their child to the pediatrician and the okay. pediatrician would help and be that segue to help them and decide whether they need to see a pediatric rheumatologist or Do, not. Are most pediatricians looking for the right things? Well, some of the things, I, since these conditions are really not seen as frequently, though it is increasing over time and the awareness is increasing over time, they often are not sure when children come with that come to them with joint pains of whether this is arthritis or if it's just general. We're, we're looking, um, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. We're looking right up here because very often I have to hear you tell you something. Our boys are 11 and 12 as we do this program. Big boy turning 13. The term growing pains come up comes up constantly. I have to tell you almost as a euphemism for everything that happens. And now you've got me thinking about this. Talk about these. Right. So growing pains is very common. Up to 40% of kids have growing pains. So what makes arthritis different from growing pains is there's certain symptoms that patients will come into their doctor. Now, if you're having pains here and there or pains after you exercise, it's not the same sort of pains that you might get with arthritis. Um, children who have these pains, it's pains that are occurring almost every day. So that's day. persistent. Persistent. Go, put that back up, team, again. Put it back up, Bob. And then swelling of the joints. So there's really swelling. Right. And again, they may not necessarily notice the swelling, but if parents do notice it, this is something that should, you know, key in their minds that they should go to their pediatrician. You wake up in the morning, uh, joint pain or stiffness on a regular basis. Hey, that's not normal. No, it's not normal because it's different. Growing pains, you may have pains worse at the end of the day. Not in the morning. Not typically in the morning. And limping? Limping is one of those that along with the stiffness that you feel in the morning, they may limp, they may not be able to straighten their legs as well. So the, if you see any of these symptoms, the parent should take their child to the pediatrician. And the last one, change or limitations in daily activities, talk about that. So a lot of times when parents come to the doctor, it's not specifically because the kid is complaining of pains. Ch parents may notice that there are changes in activities of their children. For example, I had a patient who was a baseball player. He was, I think, 10 years old, and he was a baseball player. He was still playing, running the bases, but something that he noticed differently, or his parents noticed, is that he was running slower than he used to. And when I examined him, he had arthritis or big swollen joints, but it, he really didn't notice it. He was able to still play, but the thing he really noticed is that it was slowing him At down. 10. Yes. How do you treat it? There are, there are many different types of that fall in that category of juvenile arthritis, so it really depends on what type it is. And there are different medications starting from medicines like ibuprofen that help with it, and then there's a lot more aggressive treatment as well, um, some medications called biologic agents. Are we better than we were at this? 10, we are much 10, 15 better. years ago? If you went back 20, 30 years ago, there were many children who had to be in wheelchairs. There were children who needed joint replacements. Right now, it's more of a norm that children do better than it was 20 years ago. So no reason to freak out with the diagnosis? No reason to freak out. Um, they should be concerned, get, yes. Yes, should be concerned and should get to a pediatric rheumatologist as soon as possible because the earlier we treat it and the more aggressively we treat it, it can help and it could prevent complications. You love what you do. I do. Because? Because I'm dealing with great patients all the time. I can make a difference and children can live full, healthy lives if they're treated early and aggressively. Dr. Arnold, thank you and your colleagues at St. Joseph's for sharing important information, particularly. Uh, about a topic, juvenile arthritis, that not a lot of people understand. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Stay right there. We'll be right back, right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome Mitch Rothschild, who is uh, chairman and founder of an organization called, a company called Vitals. Vitals is? Vitals is a web service and a phone-based service that helps you make intelligent choices about finding health care, knowing who's good, what other patients think, what it costs, and allowing you to make an informed decision in an area where most of us have not made informed decisions in the past. How does it work? Break it down for us. So uh, when you need health care, you're going to try to look for a particular doctor, a particular facility. 
You want to know what other patients think of them. We've got more mm -hmm. patient ratings than anybody else. You want to know if they're any good, if they've done that procedure. You're also going to want to know what it costs. Mm -hmm. And so we partner with a lot of health plans so that we can tell you your out-of-pocket cost before you go, as opposed to just waiting a couple weeks, getting the bill, and having no idea if that bill is $20 or $400. Um, and so we'll help you with quality, cost, uh, in some cases help you make an appointment. And if we are working with your health insurer or your employer, uh, we will occasionally uh, give you financial incentives to help you uh, make intelligent choices about where to get your care. But you had an experience, personally, that was eye-opening. Describe yeah, it. Indeed. Um, I'm a weekend warrior. Do uh, sports here. <laughs> Do there should be a club called Weekend Warriors. But <laughs> yes. go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, hopefully a little more frequent than that as, as, yeah. uh, as I age. And I uh, tore my Achilles and needed to get it operated on, obviously, for repair. And to make small talk on my way to the operating room, the orthopedist said to me, I'm glad you're here. I don't get to do that many uh, Achilles uh, in the course of a year. Oh, that'll build confidence. Right. And that, that was, <laughs> I felt that that was something I should have known. Immediately, the anesthesiology cone came down over my face. I fell asleep. When I woke up, I fortunately remembered that that was the kind of information I felt I should know beforehand. So we started collecting data on procedure volumes, quality of physicians, uh, quality of hospitals, and built that up. We now have a website, vitals.com, that gets about 10 million people a month that come and visit the site, leave ratings, get information, find out. We also work closely with a number of health plans to uh, be their website, the front door for, say, um, Blue Cross of Illinois or First Care or Primera and others, and help tell people the cost before they get care. So how do you, how do you actually, so I want to be clear on this because mm -hmm. My information is that you don't charge consumers. Correct. Well, then how do you make money? We, um, so our, our primary audience is the patient, the consumer, and we, in general on the web, we don't charge money. We will get paid either by the, what are called the payers, the health plans oh, okay. or the employers for generating the cost, for delivering the information. Got it. And on our website for consumers, we have advertising. Uh, okay, pharmaceutical is, advertising. Okay, got it. But there's another initiative. Um, is it called S Smart Shopper? Smart Shopper. What is yes. that? So Smart Shopper is really an innovation that we started about a year and a half ago with a company that we merged with. And that is when you're past your deductible uh, as a patient, you don't really care what something costs. So there are wide disparities in cost of, say, an MRI at an imaging center is $500, at a hospital might be $2,500. Uh, almost the same quality, in some cases better. And so we will uh, encourage you by sending you a check and helping you share in the savings by going to the less expensive ones. And we do that with MRIs and CAT scans and colonoscopies and infusion drugs and lab work and all the places where uh, the choice of facility would help you, uh, would save money for the system, and we want to save money for the system. We def describe ourselves sometimes as being an anti-GNP company. We actually lower the gross <laughs> national product of the United States because we're taking costs out of the system. That would be a good idea, though, uh, in that case. In this case, obviously, as a society that is aging and getting sick, though any way you can take some costs out of the systems to avoid rationing or price increases is a good thing. And so um, there has been a gro huge growth lately of freestanding facilities that deliver care. If you were 10, 12 years ago, you might get most of your care either at a doctor's office or a hospital. Today, you have telemedicine, you have imaging centers, you have urgent care centers, you have infusion centers, you have ambulatory surgery centers, you have clinics. Confusing uh, for consumers? Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's confusing. They don't really know. And little by little, people begin to get knowledge of it. So one place to take an example is a flu shot. Fifteen years ago, you're getting a flu shot at your doctor. Today, most flu shots happen at CVS and Walgreens. I was just going to say, CVS, I was in the other day. Right. You want your flu shot? Is that something we need to know? Does it matter where we get it? It's much less expensive for the system because to get a flu shot, you don't need somebody who went to medical school okay. and had residency to deliver that to you. And so we're able to deliver that care as a society for much less cost. Similar things happen with... 
uh, any machinery you use for CAT scans and MRIs, drugs that you get infused in you, labs. There's a company called Theranos now that um, with one drop of blood can do all your lab work. Uh, telemedicine is a much less expensive way to get uh, care an urgent care center instead of an emergency room. So there's all these places. One second, but does Vitals give information? Because obviously in public television, we're not here to advocate any product, any service, any anything. But I just want to be clear. Does Vitals give information and evaluate these services and this technology in a way that the consumer can make his or her own choice? Absolutely. We are provider agnostic. The industry we're in provider is... Provider called... agnostic. I like that. Yes. So the industry we're in is transparency. No horse in a race. Right. We want you to get the best quality care at the best possible price that you can get into in a reasonable period of time. And so we'll display the options for you the same way you'll get a search result on Google. And you can choose. You might want to go quicker and pay a little more. Mm. You might want the best guy and travel a little further. Mm. You might want to save some money or get a check. And you as a consumer decide. Before I let you out here, uh, you've had a lot of businesses. You're a very successful entrepreneur. Clearly, you've had many other businesses before this as well. So you don't expect this question. Number one leadership challenge. Excuse me. Yeah, the number one leadership challenge you have faced. I usually ask the number one leadership lesson. The number one leadership challenge you have faced in your career as an entrepreneur is? Uh, fascinatingly, I would say when you get a business to the size of 15 million in revenue, uh, you just have to change the way you do things to be able to scale and grow. And we've been blessed that we've been growing 50, 60 percent a year in vitals. And uh, the example that somebody once told me is if you're a cabinet maker and you make four cabinets a week. A few seconds, go ahead. Um, if you make uh, six cabinets, you can do it. If you get an order for 1,000 cabinets, you're in another business. The leadership <laughs> challenge is to be able to reinvent your business, to be able to grow and scale, and not to do the same things the same way. Great stuff, Mitch. All the best at uh, Vitals. We appreciate it. Come back and give us an update. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by MagnaCare, New Jersey Resources, Bloomfield College, Wells Fargo, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by Choose New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. New Jersey invented the light bulb. It keeps us well lit and monster free. Today, New Jersey produces megawatt mines that power innovation. Choose New Jersey and enter a state of brilliance.